water. It covers 70% of the planet, but less than 3% of it fresh, and nearly half the world struggling with severe water scarcity. We travel the country speaking to climate experts in the drought-stricken West. This is, to me, the manifestation of climate change. The water here should be 150 feet above our head right now, 150 feet. Plus, we take you to Jackson, Mississippi, where disinvestment and prejudice are boiling over into a water disaster. This is 2021, and I'm living like I'm in Little House on the Prairie. EPA Chief Michael Regan toured Jackson and tells us about the disturbing trend impacting the nation and what he is doing to fix it. We know that systemic Racism, lack of political representation, have contributed to low-income communities being exposed to a lack of access to good quality drinking water. Plus, Congress and the White House making a historic investment in the nation's future. We speak with the man spearheading the infrastructure push, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. America has got to get ahead of these issues. What happens to a drop of water in the middle of the run of the Colorado River could impact something two states away. For the next hour, we explore the water crises hurting Americans and jeopardizing the U.S. Plus, we introduce you to the people trying to build a bridge over troubled water. Hello and welcome to Troubled Water. I'm Greta Van Susteren. For decades, a mega drought plaguing the West, rivers shrinking, wetlands turning to dust, our most vital resource drying up. I'm in Nevada, standing by clear blue Lake Mead. This is the nation's largest reservoir, but it too is draining fast. Lake Mead, sitting on the Colorado River. Roughly 25 million Americans depend on it. It's water reaching homes, irrigating farms, providing hydropower to Arizona, California, and Nevada. Dr. Kristen Everett is Nevada's first senior climate advisor. She is also an expert in Western water resources. Lake Mead, it's the largest reservoir in the entire United States. It holds 20 mil 28 million acre feet of water. That's a tremendous amount. An acre foot is, you take a football field and put a, put a foot of water on it, that's one acre foot. So imagine 28 million football fields on top of each other. That's how much water this lake can hold. Emphasis on can hold. The reservoir, nowhere near that today. Lake Mead's water levels have been dropping since 1999. Here's a satellite photo from the year 2000. This is the lake last summer, right around its historic low. See those white bands along the cliffs and rocks? Locally, they are known as bathtub rings. They show just how far the water has dropped, and experts predict the water will fall another 30 feet over the next two years. And I'll tell you, 2020, we had 240 days without any measurable precipitation. That really hits home when it hasn't rained for that long and you're watching your water supply decline. This is, to me, the manifestation of climate change. The water here should be 150 feet above our head right now, 150 feet. That's where it would be if it was full. This lake is only 30% full right now. You know, we could have acted 25 years ago and we didn't, but the second best time to act is now. To its credit, Nevada's actions packing a big punch. Dr. Everett praising the Southern Nevada Water Authority, calling it one of the world's most progressive organizations for water conservation. We spoke to the agency's general manager, John Ensminger. As we've added 850,000 people to Southern Nevada uh, since 2002, we're actually using 23% less water. So we're doing through demand management what needs to be done to protect our supply. What did you do? Uh, largely, we took out grass. Uh, we have incentivized our residents to remove turf, and we've actually t taken out enough turf to lay an 18-inch wide piece of sod around the circumference of the globe. Who pays for that? Uh, we do. We have a $3 uh, per square foot incentive. This effort already saving the region more than 163 billion gallons of water. The Southern Nevada Water Authority also boosting water efficiency for new developments and increasing water waste fees. But it is not just about saving water. The SNWA is minimizing its footprint by recycling water. We recycle 100% of our indoor uh, water here in Southern Nevada. Uh, I tell people that you could literally leave every faucet, every showerhead on the Las Vegas Strip running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and we won't deplete any more water out of this lake. Is that unusual? 
It is unusual because most major cities don't sit on a fresh water source. So Southern California discharges most of their uh, wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. So they can't do that? Not without desalinating it. Right now, the region is using less than its annual Colorado River allocation, and it is trying to slash that number even more. Last year, Southern Nevada used 110 gallons per person per day. By 2035, it hopes to reduce that number to 86 gallons per person per day. And it may just reach that goal. Water consciousness is baked into the culture here. We live in a desert and we know it and folks here act like it. Still, even with these great strides, more work needs to be done. Otherwise, the West won't just be starved of water, it could end up in the dark. Right now, today, it's the, the elevation of the, of the lake is at 1067, 1067 feet. And once it hits about 950, you can't generate any more power at Hoover Dam. And so we have some issues there. It's not just about water. It's also water and energy. And it's water, energy, and carbon. And it's how do you have that discussion and do the best that you can for each of these issues. And I don't know if there is a win-win-win situation at hand. There are going to be trade-offs and difficult decisions that have to be made so that way we can get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions and ensure that we're resilient to the impact. Dr. Everett says it's not too late to get things right. But she warns we must turn the tides before we reach the point of no return. We're at a point where we need to change, and that change can't be incremental. It really needs to be transformational. Global warming is depleting our water supply as growing populations increase their demand. Now some of the West's largest cities scrambling, searching for new water sources. But the Midwest and East Coast suffering from their own problems. Hurricanes, receding shorelines, wrecking the already crumbling infrastructure, and tainted drinking water, a symptom of old decaying pipes. We spoke with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. He is overseeing funding from the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law. Do you think we have a water crisis in this country? Would you go so far? I would definitely say we have water problems in this country. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one pattern I noticed when I sat on the mayor's water council as a mayor was it felt like there were three kinds of communities. Uh, there were uh, the mayors who didn't have enough water, mostly from the West, the mayors who had too much water, often in the Midwest, and then mayors who had water in all the wrong places, uh, like Miami, where you got the sea level rise. Uh, the, the future is not going to look like the past, and we cannot plan for the rest of the 21st century using the strategies or the assumptions that we had in the 20th or even the 19th. America has got to get ahead of these issues. Another thing that we're doing in our department is what are called PROTECT grants. They're to help communities build more resilient infrastructure. Here's an example of where water and roads interact. Roads are getting washed out more and more because a 500-year flood is turning into an annual event. Or extreme weather where it freezes. Absolutely, and that destroys roadways. Take it from a Midwesterner. Who's I'm a Midwesterner too. Winters, right, so you know how it is, that freeze-thaw cycle. And these, you know, admittedly not very flashy topics are hugely important for taxpayers, for commuters, for the ability to maintain the infrastructure that we need. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to describe this as reaching a crisis level. As you and I sit down, we're seeing reports of super drought in the West, the kind of thing that hasn't happened in something like a thousand years. And again, sometimes it's not enough water, sometimes it's too much water, sometimes it's water not where it's supposed to be. But all of those combined are hell on our infrastructure. Secretary Pete Buttigieg was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana for eight years. He brought small city problems to the big stage, running for president in 2020. After the 2020 election, President Biden tapped Buttigieg to lead the Department of Transportation. Tell me, what does the Department of Transportation have to do with our water supply or our water system? Because I know that the EPA has one job or one part responsibility. What does Department of Transportation have? Well, we're in the infrastructure business overall, and we focus on, of course, transportation infrastructure. But one of the things that I'm trying to do with my cabinet colleagues is make sure that we're all working together whenever transportation issues and water issues come up at the same time. When I was mayor, for example, one of the biggest streetscape projects going on in the city was actually a sewer project. It was just that in order to tear up that whole street to, to get the sewer redone, uh, the, the city realized you might as well reimagine the streets at the same time. 
we need to learn to think about things across the different silos of the federal government because housing, transportation, internet connections, pipes, they all fit together. Last November, President Biden signed the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure plan. The law will invest $55 billion in communities across the country to expand access to clean drinking water. You know, a drop of water doesn't know uh, what state it's in. And we've got to be better, I think, as a country about managing these very limited resources. Because what happens to a drop of water in the middle of the run of the Colorado River could impact something two states away, or could have a huge impact in Indian country, uh, in communities that weren't a party to some of these agreements between states mm -hmm. about who gets what water when. We've got to make sure as a matter of fairness, as a matter of economic strength, and, and just as a matter of common sense, uh, to manage water in a way that recognizes that there may be less of it to go around in a lot of parts of the country over the next few years. Coming up, millions of Americans stuck with undrinkable water poison in their taps. Who is responsible for getting the lead out of the pipes? I asked Secretary Buttigieg after the break. Welcome back to Troubled Water. The bipartisan infrastructure law investing more than $1 trillion in our roads, bridges, ports, and more and more than $50 billion going toward the nation's drinking water, wastewater systems, and stormwater infrastructure. I asked Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg how that money will be used. The bipartisan infrastructure bill, what does that do to help you implement the things you need to do to handle the water issues in this country? Well, the bipartisan infrastructure bill has a huge amount of funding to help communities with their water infrastructure issues. A lot of it is just quality getting lead out of pipes. Is that you or is that the state and local government? Who, who's a responsible for be, getting the water, the lead out of the pipes? Well, the state and local government have kind of been left on their own. Uh, now, through these dollars, they're gonna get help through the federal government. Not me and my department, uh, most of this will be through the EPA. Uh, but I'll be looking on with a lot of interest because it's so important to get this right. There is no safe level of lead in drinking water for a child. In 2014, lead contamination made international headlines with the Flint water crisis. Tests showed skyrocketing lead levels, some samples way past what is considered hazardous waste. And for years, bottled water had to be brought into the city. Since 2014, Flint has replaced 10,000 pipes and checked more than 27,000 pipes. I know this is the EPA issue, but do we know, I mean, we've seen the stories about Flint, Michigan. Um, do we know all the areas in the country which have lead problems? My biggest fear is that we just haven't looked some places, that there are probably some places where there's a lot of lead in the water, for instance, and the pipes are leaking, but we just haven't noticed it yet. There's probably more shoes to drop. I will say there's a lot of testing that goes on through federal, state, and local standards to try to identify these issues. Uh, but you know, we continue to read headlines about another community that's that's got issues. And by the way, lead exposure runs deep in this country. Uh, I was one of the many people shaking my head at those stories from Flint, only to discover my own community of South Bend had very disturbing levels of lead in children's blood, not because of the water. The water was fine. I was sure of that as, as mayor running the water utility, but because of paint in houses. And uh, there are so many different things in the environment that can be a threat to children. The things I focus on as transportation secretary are the emissions that go into the air, heavy metals, particulate matter, and you can see it in the numbers, direct correlations between living near a busy highway or a busy port and things like asthma affecting children. So this is really a fairness and justice issue too. And it's one more reason why more electric vehicles, cleaner equipment at our ports, on our highways, is going to make a difference, not just in climate change globally, but in public health locally. It is a long road ahead. Roughly 10 million U.S. households and 400,000 schools lack access to safe drinking water. In terms of the infrastructure bill, um, how do you decide who gets what? I mean, if you've got, I mean, you've got a limited amount of resources, and you might have a community that has problems, but you have another community that has problems, and you have a limited amount of resources to fix these problems. That's exactly right. E even with these big numbers, they are limited and uh, we're gonna have to be very smart about ensuring that they're used effectively. So there's basically two ways that a dollar can, can go out. One is that people come to us with projects and our department uses the criteria we've laid out, 
How will this create jobs? How will this improve safety? Uh, is it equitable? Does it make sense for the climate? And based on that, we're gonna pick the best projects and we're gonna fund them. That's actually the minority of the, the dollars. More of them will go out through partnerships where we team up with a state or another department and they make the decisions about what to do. I know what it's like to be a mayor knocking on the door of literally this building that I work in now, trying to get help. And it's not always been the easiest thing for communities to navigate, especially rural communities, lower income communities, the very ones that we need to go out of our way to help. Up next, dry, empty fields, farmers' livelihoods at risk, but one tech factory thriving, using billions of gallons of water a year. Is it fair? I get really emotional about it because agriculture's, you know, it's been in our family for so many years and we're trying to hang on to this farm. Plus, later in the show, we speak to EPA Chief Michael Regan about the nation's water afflictions. This is a big problem. It didn't happen overnight. It won't be solved overnight. Welcome back to Troubled Water. The Colorado River Basin's first mandatory water cuts now underway. And additional cutbacks brought on with the 500 plus plan. That's an agreement among Arizona, Nevada, California, and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. It aims to leave an additional 500,000 acre feet of water in Lake Mead in both 2022 and 2023. That's enough water to serve 1.5 million households for one year. And with water growing scarcer, two massive industries are clashing over usage rights. My colleague Morgan Lowe explains. The controversy comes down to this. We have government officials here telling people to conserve water. In some cases, they're telling farmers they can't have any water. And then they green light a mega microchip factory like this one that's going to use billions of gallons of water every year. My granddad bought this farm in 1930. Kaywood Farms has been in the Kaywood family for five generations. Is it a tough business? You know, it's always a tough business and you know, we're dependent on weather. We don't know what mother nature's gonna throw at us. Right now she's throwing a drought at us. Nancy Kaywood says this drought has been particularly tough. The farm's water allocation from San Carlos Lake dried up. Even after last year's wet summer, it's still not enough to grow a crop. There's about 80 acres out here, and um, because of drought, we haven't been able to plant it. This is the result. Dry, dusty, fallow fields. Could this really cost farmers their livelihoods? Yes, it sure could. All over Pinal County, Arizona, you see the signs of the drought. Empty fields, abandoned cotton gins, and it may get worse. The water allocation from the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project Canal dropped in January and could disappear altogether in 2023. But north of Pinal County's dusty fields, an industry that also relies on large amounts of water is thriving and expanding. Two giant semiconductor projects are getting underway. Intel is expanding in Chandler and Taiwan Semiconductor is building its own microchip plant in North Phoenix. It's an industry that has had a sordid history in the Valley of the Sun. It is a legacy in the Phoenix area that we're still living with today. Dennis Shirley runs Synergy Environmental. He says the older microchip plants that employed thousands in Phoenix in the 50s, 60s and 70s were major polluters contaminating groundwater with cancer-causing solvents. But Shirley says the modern-day microchip plants are a far cry from their polluting predecessors. Do you think these companies are better environmental stewards today than they were 30, 40 years ago? Oh, <laughs> they've learned their lesson. So I would say with almost 100% certainty, yes. The plants do still use a lot of water, but people in the business community say the trade-off is worth it. You know, these two companies could have produced these chips anywhere in the world, and they selected Greater Phoenix. Chris Camacho is the president of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. He says these projects will create thousands of high-paying jobs and tens of thousands of indirect jobs. Why would we want these projects here when they use a lot of water? These kind of uses in terms of you know, providing high quality jobs in this modern economy are critically important. 
Taiwan Semiconductor is spending $12 billion on a microchip manufacturing complex at I-17 and the 303. The company weathered a major drought in Taiwan last summer. At our estimates, a drop of water is reused 3.5 times in our manufacturing process, and we achieve a 90% water recycling rate, wrote a spokesperson for the company. In Chandler, Intel is spending $20 billion to build two new factories. The company used 5 billion gallons of water last year, but cleaned then released 80% of the water back into the Chandler system for treatment and reuse. We're in a drought, a long-term drought. Uh, farmers are having to cut back. Governments are asking that citizens cut back. What has Intel done to become more water conscious? So Intel has been investing, making significant investments in water conservation for well over the last two decades. Linda Chan from Intel says the company sponsors projects that add water here in the valley and to other parts of the state. You know, in 2020, we funded projects that restored more than 600 million gallons of water to support Arizona watersheds. When you see fields that are fallow, that are just dust bowls, how does that affect you? I get really emotional about it because agriculture's, you know, it's been in our family for so many years and we're trying to hang on to this farm. Back in Pinal County, Nancy Kaywood you know, says she understands the need to attract big twice. business to Arizona, the, but she says she wishes policymakers gave her industry some attention in this time of crisis. Do you feel like farmers are getting the same respect from state lawmakers? No, no, I don't. There are some steps government leaders here in Arizona can take to help these farmers. For example, some of the farmers told me they are required to pay for a water allotment, whether they receive that water or not, which means some of them are paying for a product they're not getting. Greta, back to you. At first glance, these water allocations appear wildly inequitable. But it's important to note Industry only accounts for 6% of Arizona's water consumption. Agriculture uses 72%. Coming up, a fight for water rights from a Native American reservation to Capitol Hill. This river is the lifeblood. It's been here for generations. Uh, it's, it's part of our, our tradition and it's part of our culture. That's after the break. Welcome back to Troubled Water. Clean, safe water, a human right. But a report by Dig Deep and the U.S. Water Alliance showing more than two million Americans don't have running water. And Native Americans are 19 times more likely than white households to be without. We went out to learn more about this water poverty and what is being done to address it. One in three Navajo don't have a sink or toilet. On other reservations across the country, people traveling miles to fill jugs and water tanks. Some tribal nations litigating water rights claims for decades. But the Biden administration taking steps to tackle these injustices. The Department of the Interior announcing this year nearly $2 billion going toward tribal water rights settlements. That money taken from the bipartisan infrastructure law. In a statement, Interior Secretary Deb Holland saying, Water rights are crucial to ensuring the health, safety, and empowerment of tribal communities. But the water rights issue going beyond water-starved peoples, some tribes have ample supply, but little agency over it. Take the Colorado River Indian Tribes, also known as CRIT. It can divert and receive more than 700,000 acre-feet of water to its lands in Arizona and California. The tribe wants to lease, exchange, and store the water it is not using to places off the reservation, but it cannot without Congress's authorization. We went to the Crit Reservation and spoke with the tribe's chairwoman, Amelia Flores. We can use our water, which is allocated to us, only on our lands that we live on right now. What water we don't use now goes back into the river. Our senators, Kelly and Cinema, have introduced our Colorado River Resiliency Act in Congress so that we can be able to lease portions of our water, not all of our water, but portions of it, and not sell, but lease, and still maintain our agriculture 
are farming on our lands. In March, Chairwoman Flores came to Capitol Hill, meeting with Senator Kelly, before the two testified in front of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. Tribes hold significant water rights that can position them to lead on water conservation and drought management. The river needs all the tools that can be made available to survive this continued trend of less and less water. This legislation, S3308, will provide additional tools. Crit can't profit off leasing water, at least not yet. But as drought torments the region, Crit is getting paid for the water it conserves, the tribe earning $38 million for leaving 150,000 acre-feet of water in Lake Mead over three years. It will save some of that water by fallowing farmland. We spoke to Josh Moore, manager of the Crit Farm, to hear about other methods of conservation. I think everybody's coming to the realization that we can't, we can't sustain unless we change. What we've done in the drought so far, um, we've really looked at ways of uh, reducing our water consumption and, and lowering our consumptive use, whether that be through alternative methods of irrigation, um, changing out the types of crops that we grow. We're utilizing drip irrigation technology from Israel and we're piloting it on, on the farm that I manage. But we're also uh, looking at things like center pivot irrigation, which has been used in the Midwest for, 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 for generations. Are you confident though that the change in technology and the conservation and the things that you're implementing now outpace climate change and the risks that we're hearing as this amount of water diminishes. Are you confident? This is a shared responsibility. It's not just one farm that can change its methods and all of a sudden the problem will be fixed. I think that users up and down the river and all throughout the region really have to change our thinking and looking at ways that we can all start conserving um, and trying to use less water to save the river. Everyone must work together to boost the region's water security. It goes without saying, all people living in the Colorado River Basin rely on its water for agriculture and daily life. But it is important to remember, Crit's history is also intertwined with the Colorado River. This river is the lifeblood. It's been here for generations. Uh, it's, it's part of our, our tradition and it's part of our culture. But now I need to think of it as something that might disappear and what can I do to protect the river and prolong its life. If we don't conserve or if we don't look at climate change in the environment, it's our, it's our own families that are at stake. It's not, it's not the bottom line of a corporation or it's not how well our stocks are gonna do. It's what is my family gonna lose if we don't make a change or if we don't protect our, our resources. Up next, we take you to Mississippi where much needed water repairs and unanswered complaints are pushing one community to take matters into their own hands. My people get riled up because they pay for a service and they should get that service. Welcome back to Troubled Water. Our nation, one of the richest in the world, but 10 million households without clean, safe drinking water. And last year in Jackson, Mississippi, tens of thousands of people facing water outages, winter storms slamming the city, sleet and ice crippling its water treatment facility. What happened? And what is being done to avoid a repeat? My colleague, CJ Lamaster has the answers. When it would rain, I'd be, have a bucket right out there on my deck to catch water. And I'm like, this is archaic. You know, this is 2021. And I'm living like I'm in Little House on the Prairie. We couldn't wash clothes. We couldn't wash our bodies. Flush these toilets. It would be 18 days before Kehinde Gaynor's house got water again. And nearly a month before his family could even drink it without having to boil it first. Gainer is one of more than 43,000 homes and businesses on Jackson's surface water system left high and dry for weeks. What caused it? Sustained periods of freezing weather that hit the OB Curtis water treatment plant. Over several days last February, that weakness caused the entire exposed system to crash after a pair of winter storms hit the capital city. Typically, when water moves through that screening system, thousands of gallons every second move to a conventional basin and a membrane system, both of which help remove solids and sediment from the water. That water is then treated with chemicals and UV light to kill any bacteria present, and after one more step, sent through pipes to 43,000 homes and businesses. All of that came to a frigid halt last February. By that Wednesday, we had hit what I consider ground zero, where we just, we couldn't bring any water in, and we couldn't send any water out. And also, too, we're dealing with water main breaks, because once we started getting water into the system, 
obviously we started to have breaks because pressure was starting to be restored slowly. They also had to refill more than a dozen storage tanks to supply that water to the entire city. It was more evident that over the years, the inability of doing the necessary upgrades, winterization, new pumps, you know, filters, by not having all of these additional measures in place, it took a lot longer for us to get the system back up. The plant was already in a fragile condition. This emergency administrative order issued by the EPA nearly a year before that February 2021 collapse came from an inspection that revealed problems with the membrane system, raw water filters, and the plant's ability to sterilize the water. Now city engineer Charles Williams says they're working to enclose those parts of the plant which iced over last year with the first part of that winterization completed next April. But none of that will help if another freeze happens between now and then. The system is vulnerable at any particular time. Jackson Mayor Shokwe Antar Lumumba has said repeatedly it would cost at least a billion dollars just to address water needs. And Mississippi has more than three billion in federal funds waiting to be doled out. One proposal by State Representative Shonda Yates would give a small portion of that money with strings attached to help tackle four projects. Let's do the math. This summer, Jackson will get $21 million in ARPA funds. They've got about $5 million left over from last year's allocation. Add the legislature's money on top of that, and you get $66 million to pay for water repairs. But the full scope of this problem is massive in scale. Just coming into compliance with the EPA's sewer consent decree will cost $960 million. Deficiencies from that EPA emergency administrative order will cost another $170 million on the water system side, and that doesn't count eventually replacing most of the city's pipes. Yates hopes her bill represents the beginning of a partnership between lawmakers and Jackson to repair the city's aging system. This will be a great litmus test for that. If we can show that this $40 million is used effectively, efficiently, and responsibly. But getting lawmakers from outside Jackson to buy in is difficult. There's a growing lack of confidence in the city's ability to operate its system. That skepticism led to senators gutting Yates' bill and replacing it with language that would bring more oversight, but no guarantee of any money. Part of that mistrust comes from how the city has run its water and sewage systems over time. One of the biggest examples of that, a $90 million contract with Siemens for new water meters, most of which Jackson says were installed incorrectly, and the billing issues that followed with some residents going months, even years, without ever receiving a water bill. More recently, the EPA issued a stern warning to Jackson that it was out of compliance because they still hadn't fixed a damaged electrical panel from an April fire at the treatment plant. When Mayor Lumumba cited supply chain issues as the reason, Williams told reporters when they ordered the part. January the 13th. Nine months after the fire. But there's a larger picture here, too, where blame for Jackson's neglect extends to the federal government. Fifty years ago, Congress passed what's now known as the Clean Water Act, which allowed for construction of a regional wastewater treatment plant for Jackson and surrounding areas and provided 75 percent of those costs. But during the Reagan administration, all that grant money dried up, leaving city leaders to raise water and sewer rates to make up the difference. And then the historic Easter flood of 1979 hit. That flood led to an exodus of people leaving Jackson. That combined with decades of white and economic flight accelerated the city's decline. Since 1980, the capital city's population has dropped more than 24 percent, with almost 50,000 leaving, many to bedroom communities in the metro. Those reasons, however, aren't often cited by lawmakers, with many instead saying Jackson's mayors have mismanaged the water system for decades. At the same time, residents don't care who's to blame. They want it fixed. The fact remains, reliable water in the Jackson area right now is a hope, not a guarantee. Cities like Byram went 30 to 45 days without water when the O.B. Curtis plant froze. My people get riled up because they pay for a service and they should get that service. Now, Byram wants off Jackson's water system. Uh, I'm not so sure that after we do all this infrastructure that it's not going to cost a little bit more to have our water, but we'll be in charge of it. A new Byram water system is still at least three years from being realized. While that group still plans to pay Jackson to treat their sewage, one key chunk of customers has already broken off. Thousands who live and work in West Rankin County. We really did not want to leave the system. I mean, the, the, the goal was to try to stay where we were um, and, and continue uh, working with Jackson. But, you know, it, it finally became clear that in the best interest of the citizens 
uh, of, of West Rankin, we needed to have an, our own system to be able to control our destiny, to, to be able to make sure that there was wastewater there when we needed it. The loss of those customers would mean a loss of millions of dollars in revenue for an already cash-strapped capital city and comes at a time when the city needs $1.7 billion to address its aging water and sewer system. Meanwhile, residents like Gaynor find themselves at a crossroads when it comes to Jackson's future. I still don't really want to leave, um, but it doesn't mean that I don't think about it all the time. Up next, EPA Chief Michael Regan committing to taking action on his Journey to Justice tour. There is absolutely no reason that every person in this country should not have access to safe drinking water. We speak to him after the break. Welcome back to Troubled Water. We have highlighted the water inequity facing cities like Jackson, Mississippi, decades of disinvestment and neglect, leaving their infrastructure wanting, and these cities without the funds to fix it. EPA Chief Michael Regan says, these communities are so far behind, they cannot catch up by themselves. Regan is traveling the country on his Journey to Justice tour, looking at the adversity firsthand. He is partnering with local leaders, working together to help communities left behind. We met up with the administrator at EPA headquarters. It's so unthinkable that this country wouldn't have clean water. I mean, we read about in other communities like Flint is another one that's gotten a lot of attention. But I read there's, there was raw sewage that was leaking into the drinking water in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, we've seen that all across the country. I was just in Lowndes County, Alabama as well, where I actually saw straight piping of sewage from a home into the very yards that children are playing. When I was in Jackson, Mississippi, I was scheduled to do a speech for some elementary um, school children. And I pulled up to the building uh, only to find out that all of the children had been evacuated because there was low water pressure. I saw lined along the sidewalk, porta potty after porta potty. And after talking with the principal, she let me know that number one, the low water pressure and water quality issues, it's nearly a daily and weekly occurrence. So the students at this elementary school actually use those porta potties every day. To think that students don't have access to good quality drinking water, nor water to wash their hands during a pandemic is something that no parent should ever have to experience, let alone our children. Is it an economic and racial issue? Because I mean, let, let's talk about Jackson, Mississippi. 25% um, of the people in that city live in, under, in the poverty level or below which is the national level is 11%, so 25% is pretty high. It is a predominantly African-American city. Uh, I think about 82% of the, uh, of the people there are African-American, and it is one of the worst places in the city, in the country for drinking water. Is this an economic racial issue in, in some ways? It is. I think that when we look at Jackson, Mississippi, when we look at Lowndes County, Alabama, when we look all across this country, disproportionately low income and communities of color are the communities that are bearing the brunt of these lack of investments and these exposures to pollution. So we know that systemic racism, uh, lack of interest in low income communities, lack of political representation have contributed to the disproportionate impact of black and brown and low income communities being exposed to a lack of access to good quality drinking water. We've seen that firsthand. What other communities have you seen that are suffering from this? Jackson, Mississippi was just the tip of the spear. Uh, we toured St. James and St. John parishes in Louisiana. We rounded out that trip in Houston, Texas. And most recently, I was in Lowndes County, Alabama. Uh, but I've also been in Chicago and Detroit and Wisconsin. And when we think about the lead uh, exposure in this country, the lead pipes that are still in place that are, you know, somewhere between six and 10 million lead service lines in this country. It's really uh, unfortunate that so many of our communities don't have quality uh, infrastructure, but are also disproportionately exposed to things like lead poisoning. When is that going to be fixed? What's the, what's the timeline? You know, thanks to the, the president's leadership and this bipartisan infrastructure law, we have about $15 billion dedicated to replacing these lead service lines. Luckily for us, there are some cities that are out in front of the curve like Newark, New Jersey, who have already put programs in place and are already have already replaced their lead service lines. But there are so many more like Benton Harbor, Michigan and you know uh, Jackson, Mississippi, 
we're going to work on getting these resources into the hands of these states by this fall. And by this fall, the states will then use their discretion to distribute these resources to begin these projects. I imagine all the people, and I, this, I point out Jackson, Mississippi, they've been under a consent decree since 2012 with the EPA to do things. And obviously that predates you considerably. Um, but you know, so nothing really was done if we're still coming up to the present time and they continue to have horrible problems. So you know, I, I can imagine that they're incredibly discouraged. I mean, how, how can you have confidence in the government if 2012 it looked like things would get fixed because their feet were put to the fire in the community, yet it wasn't? You know, there is absolutely no question that the communities have lost trust in their state, local, and federal governments. We're working very hard to rebuild that trust in Jackson in particular. Yes, there is a consent order in place, but since we've been in office, we are working to provide technical assistance so that they can begin to solve some of these problems. We're also providing technical assistance to the community so that they can effectively ap apply for these grants. One of the interesting pieces of the bipartisan infrastructure law resources is these resources are available with zero to no interest loans and or non-matching grants. This allows communities to be at the table that have never been at the table before because they're not having to bring the matching dollars. If I lived in Flint, Michigan, and I, you know, I had terrible water for all those years, I'd be sort of apprehensive, you know, with the government coming in and saying, okay, it's fixed now. This has to be very transparent. The first thing we do by traveling to these communities, number one, is acknowledging that they have not been served effectively by their state, local, or federal government. We're telling them that we see them we hear them, and then we want to engage with them on many of the solutions that they've been advocating for decades. This is something that this administration is taking very seriously. And thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have $50 billion to ensure that it's being done correctly. Is that enough? It's a start. It's a significant shot in the arm, and it's gonna really take the efforts of the federal government and public-private partnerships to begin to invest in our crumbling infrastructure. It is a great shot in the arm, and we believe with private dollars associated with it that we can see tremendous progress. Coming up, plastic choking our oceans, but a friendly face doing his part to head it off at the pass. We introduce you to Baltimore's local superhero. That's after the break. Welcome back to Troubled Water. For decades, plastic strangling our waters Scientists say every year at least 11 million metric tons flowing into our oceans. One study warning that in 30 years, oceans could have more plastic than fish. A coalition in Baltimore is working to prevent that. Mr. Trash Wheel is located in the city's inner harbor. The googly-eyed trash interceptor sits at the mouth of the Jones Falls. Together with his partners, Mr. Trash Wheel has helped collect nearly 2,000 tons of trash and debris. That is 4 million pounds. So how does it work? We met up with the inventor to find out. I worked on Baltimore Harbor for 20 years. Every day as I walked around the harbor for my job, I'd see the trash in the harbor and I'd hear the reaction of the tourist. Ugh, this harbor's disgusting. I'm John Kellett. I invented the trash wheel. I drew it on a napkin. I drew it on a napkin at a Christmas party. And we're on Mr. Trash Wheel. You designed this one? Yes. Um, why? What, what, provo what provoked this? Before this hotel was here on the side of the river, there used to be a parking lot here. And I parked my car in the parking lot every day when I went to work. And I'd walk across this footbridge to go over to my office. And every day, particularly if it was raining, I'd see the trash flowing into the harbor. And I actually called the city and I said, you know, we need to do something about the fact that trash is the first impression that people have of our harbor. And the city says, well, we're open to ideas. Why don't we have like a floating hay baler that can bail it, pick it up and bail it as it comes down the river. And it was like, well, you don't need to bail it. Let's just have that first part of that hay baler, which is picking up, you know, have rakes and pick it up from the water and get rid of it. My name is Adam Lindquist, and I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore. Whenever trash goes into a storm drain here in Baltimore, it doesn't get filtered out. It doesn't go to a treatment plant. It flows unfiltered into our streams and harbor. So the trash we collect isn't just people throwing garbage in the river. It's from the entire city of Baltimore. 
Mr. Trash Wheel is the world's first sustainably powered trash interceptor. He uses the power of sun and the power of the water to pick trash up out of the river and put it into a dumpster barge so it doesn't go out into the Chesapeake Bay. He's a hungry guy and uh, you know he has eaten over 1,700 tons of trash and debris. We've picked up, uh, geez, over 13 million cigarette butts, over a million plastic bottles, over a million styrofoam containers. It's a nice warm spot that's just sitting here basking. What's the most memorable thing you've ever collected? I mean, the most memorable thing is like a live python snake native to West Africa, probably someone's escaped pet, came down the river and climbed up on Mr. Trash Wheel. All right, I confess, I love the googly eyes. Uh, whose idea was that? So the googly, I mean, I was one of the co-creators of Mr. Trash Wheel. I actually built the first set of googly eyes in my basement and we put them up there and said, you know, that looks amazing. Let's make them permanent. And his family members are named what? So Mr. Trash Wheel was the original, but he also has some friends here, Professor Trash Wheel, Captain Trash Wheel, and Gwenda, the Good Wheel of the West. We realized we're just gonna be picking up this trash forever if we don't engage people in solving this problem. And that's why we put a set of five foot tall googly eyes on this trash interceptor and gave him a whole social media persona so he can interact with the people of Baltimore and the kids of Baltimore as well who love him. There was a poll once um, for uh, best unelected leader in Baltimore City and Mr. Trash Wheel won that poll. So Mr. Trash Wheel, he's a success. Mr. Trash Wheel is, is, is a runaway success. This world has a limited supply of water and it must be treasured, protected. One thing we learned speaking to all these people across the country, there is hope. It's not too late. We can all be part of the solution. That's it for us. I'm Greta Van Susteren. Thank you for watching Troubled Water.